Let's begin to understand health and wellness from the individual perspective. At a personal level, well-being includes both objective and subjective dimensions. The objective aspect of well-being is the term defining material well-being and the quality of material life. It is formed and influenced by the quality of the material life, such as the level and stability of income, the conditions of residence, the opportunity of having education, safety, and security. Different from the objective well-being, subjective well-being focuses more on the feelings toward three aspects. Firstly, intrapersonal. It is within oneself, a sense of being or self-worth, and then interpersonal. That is more about you and the environment of others, such as a sense of belonging, connectedness, or being loved. And finally, looking forward, which is a sense of becoming or a sense of hope for the future. Then, what are the predictors of our subjective well-being? And how can we improve our subjective well-being according to these factors? Yang and Chao have identified eight independent variables and one interactive variable to be the predictors of subjective well-being. These include marital status, self-esteem, internal locus of control, help-seeking attitude, frequency of financial, emotional, and health problems, and age with many chronic illnesses. The first four predictors, marital status, self-esteem, internal locus of control, help-seeking attitude, have a positive correlation with subjective well-being. Let's take marriage as an example. Those who are married predict better subjective well-being. The remaining predictors, for example, frequency of financial, emotional, and health problems, and age with many chronic illnesses, are negatively correlated with subjective well-being. Is there any age difference in subjective well-being? Based on Yang and Chao's study, there is probably no significant age difference. It is relatively constant and indeed gradually increased in subjective well-being for those who do not have any chronic illnesses. However, subjective well-being declines more rapidly with the increase of age and number of chronic illnesses, especially when people have five or more diseases this also warns us to take care of our health conditions to achieve better subjective well-being. Also, there is another definition of subjective well-being raised by Diener. It has three parts, life satisfaction, presence of positive affect, and the relative absence of negative affect. Life satisfaction is a cognitive judgment to see how satisfied a person is with his or one's life. It can be examined in different life domains, such as employment status, finance, interpersonal relationships, hobbies, so on and so forth. The picture beside provides information on what specific aspects of life which contribute to overall satisfaction. In Diener's study, most participants are somewhat satisfied with their life. How about the situation in Hong Kong? Referring to a research conducted by Chinese University of Hong Kong in 2018, we know that general life satisfaction we know that general life satisfaction is increasing in the whole year of 2017. However, the quality of life index is decreasing. Please check the link that is attached. See what is better and what is worse in Hong Kong and share your findings with your classmate. Emotion is another component when people are evaluating subjective well-being. It is measured by the frequency and intensity of the pleasant or unpleasant emotions. There is a positive and negative affect schedule for measuring the emotional components. Some researchers applied psychometric scales that consist of several words describing different feelings and emotions. The participants also indicate how they feel right now or over the past few weeks, referring to the words the researcher provide, such as happy, angry, and the like. Through the correlational study, Schimack and Diener claim that the frequency of emotions is more important than their intensity when evaluating the subjective well-being. However, this measurement still raises some discussion. For example, one considers emotional components as unidimensional, which means that the presence of positive emotions indicates the absence of negative emotions, and vice versa. Others think emotions are bidimensional, Positive and negative emotions are two separate dimensions with different causes and effects. People could experience both positive and negative emotions at the same time. Which view is more reasonable based on your personal experience?
After analyzing health and wellness as a personal issue, we move on to another perspective in understanding health and wellness. Is health and wellness a personal concern or a social issue? Before that, I'm going to introduce to you ecological system theory from Brofen Benner. This theory offers us a framework to think about this question through which community psychologists examine individuals' relationship within the communities and the wider society. There are four interrelated types of environmental systems in Brofen Brenner's classic rendition of the ecological systems theory, namely the micro, meso, exo, and macro systems. These levels range from smaller proximal settings in which individuals directly interact to larger, distal parameters that indirectly influence development. The various levels within ecological system theories are often presented graphically as a series of four systems nested around a focal individual, like a set of concentric circles, as the graph shows, or a collection of Russian dolls. Individuals typically find themselves entangled in various ecosystem, different layers, from the most intimate and then to the most comprehensive system, which includes society and culture. Each of these ecological systems inevitably interacts with and influences each other in all aspects of their lives. Microsystem is the closest and most direct layer, including family, school, and peers. Mesosystem involves the processes that occur between multiple microsystems in which individuals embed. Many microsystems are interconnected. The exosystem is the next outermost layer. It includes the microsystems in which individuals are involved but not directly embedded in. It means links between social settings. The outermost system is the macrosystem, which is defined as the set of overarching beliefs, values, and norms, as reflected in the cultural, religious, and socioeconomic organization of society. Finally, the macrosystem influences development within and among all other systems and serves as a filter or lens through which an individual interprets future experiences. Finally, the Cronus system looks at the transition over the life course. It means socio-historical circumstances. After analyzing health and wellness as a personal issue, we move on to another point of view. Next, we may think of health and wellness as a social responsibility. A term called public health is the art and science of preventing disease, prolonging life, and promoting health through the organized efforts of society. The overall vision is to encourage more excellent health and well-being sustainably, the complete strengthening integrated public health service and reducing inequalities. In other words, the government should take the responsibility to develop a preventive and sustainable environment policies for the whole population. It covers different works, disease prevention, health promotion, and intervention based on the public health model. It is different from the medical model, which focus primarily on the curative medicine. Public health can be understood as a critical aspect of the more comprehensive health system and can play an essential role in improving the effectiveness and efficiency of health system delivery. Nowadays, when talking about public health, people attach increasing attention to the environment. For example, how to decrease pollution in their daily life and how to cut down on their waste to protect the earth. For the whole population, environment and public health are also interconnected to each other. Environmental health is a component of public health system concerned with all aspects of natural and built environment affecting human health. More specifically, the environmental pollution, such as air, water, and soil, may degrade the whole population's quality of life or push them into disaster with infection, chronic illness, and body impairments. That's the reason why government and some organization now appeal to environmental sustainability. It is not only consuming less, but also making the full cycle of production, use, and disposal more sustainable. This action will help the human being live in a better place and get rid of the harm from pollution and over waste. Besides, policy plays an essential role in public health issue. Health policy refers to the decision, plans, and action that are undertaken to achieve specific health care goals within society. It helps to create the conditions that ensure good health from the entire population. 
It involves several processes, such as identifying the health problems, its determinants and impacts, assessing the risk and benefits, and establishing the intervention. It also needs different stakeholders' involvement, the government, the community, the citizens, and even global cooperations. As good health policies, it should incorporate various stakeholders' needs and abilities, national public health partnerships, and the like. What are the health policies in Hong Kong? The public health policies have already integrated into different areas of citizens' daily life. It positively makes efforts to improve the living environments of the citizens. Hong Kong government continues contributing to environmental sustainability, like improving air quality and enhancing waste management and urban forestry. Besides, the agenda includes their wills to build a caring, inclusive society and improve people's livelihood. The government hopes to enhance the upward mobility and help low-income families as poverty alleviation. Also, support the disadvantaged and care for the young. As we know, aging is one of the serious concerns in society. Thus, the government is creating an age-friendly community and providing higher quality elderly care to the public. The graph only shows 10 areas related to the public health. Please refer to the link attached for further information and see how Hong Kong government devotes to improving the health and wellness. I believe that you already know some theories and information about personal health and public health. Let's take aging as an example to further discuss on current challenges our society is facing and what does health and wellness mean to the older adults themselves, to their family, or even to the whole society. Successful aging is measured by four facets of health, both physical health and psychological health, subjective health, and objective health. There are six different dimensions of health, absence of objective physical disability, subjective physical health, length of active life, objective mental health, objective social support, and subjective life satisfaction. We can estimate that in the West, positive aging still confines to the older adults themselves. Even the mission of positive aging are to add more lives to the years. Understanding aging from a positive view, stemming out from the postmodern perspective, aims to deconstruct the social labels that the elderly are burdened and suffering from impairment and chronic illnesses. This recent postmodern construction of the aging emphasizes the cultural interaction between the complexity of the aging body and the social context in shaping and reconstructing the meaning of aging, from the negative symptoms of aging to aging well. World Health Organization launches an active aging policy framework, viewing aging as a positive experience of continued growth and participation in family, community, and societal activities, regardless of physical and cognitive decline. It emphasizes on the older adult's autonomy and shows respect to their choices. And this framework appeals to the cooperation with family, community, and society, the micro, meso, and macro systems to enhance the older adult's quality of life. How about the situation in Hong Kong? What is the positive aging in Hong Kong? Positive aging increasingly becomes a relevant theme for public policy concerning older people's welfare. Advocacy for the policy hopes to extend people's work life, education, both their careers and leisure, social and community participation, and adding life to their years rather than adding years to their life. This advocacy takes the assumption that older people are capable and they can retain their role in the community. The policy tact would improve older people's quality of life in substantial ways. Positive aging can be distinguishable from other alternative concepts such as productive aging and successful healthy aging. It is more embracing, integrating concerns for both the individual and society and their interaction. It emphasizes the older individual's contribution to society and individual's well-being and health. Positive aging maintains that older people have abundant positive resources to facilitate their positive contribution to self and society. Positive aging compromises three components, positive resources, positive contribution to the self and the society. What does positive resources mean here? Positive resources include experiences, beliefs, knowledge, wisdom skills, and potential for development. Furthermore, 
Positive aging involves the older adults making use of these resources to contribute to the self and society. Resources are definitely important conditions for contribution and receiving empowerment. Positive resource include autonomy, self-reliance, knowledge, and ability of self-care, ability to work, altruism, and life philosophy. Chang and his colleagues quote from the interviews that the participants mentioned about the freedom of doing what they wanted and taking care of themselves, so on and so forth. Among those positive resources, autonomy encourages them to do and get what the individual wants and bolster their independence, interests, and self-determination for quality care. Self-reliance emerges from the older adult's desire and ability to prevent being the burden of the society. They are willing to take care of themselves. Clearly, it is one important goal in geriatric care and self-care is also an integral component of wellness. Provided with the prevalence of self-care ability, professional services can turn to those really in need and contribute to the society by bettering the use of public resources. At the same time, while experiencing the physical and cognitive decline, the elderly still seeks to work. It undeniably enables the older person's working, which is usually salutary, for sustaining the individual's quality of life. Working helps convey the sense of meaning to the individual. Furthermore, it would contribute to the society by maintaining the social order, reducing prejudice and discrimination against older people in society. It thus indirectly contributes to intergenerational harmony in society. Altruism is the older individual's belief that it is better to help others and be helped. It is important to apply what is learned to reciprocate benefits obtained from society. It enhances positive social relationships with others and culture and can contribute to the community by maintaining order and solidarity. Finally, we talk about life philosophy, purpose in life, or spirituality. It is found in an older person who valued applying what is learned and devalued the pursuit of fame and profit. It represents an essential quest of human beings in their lives. Having the stock of life philosophy would equip the older individual with a better orientation to life. Let's move on to the next component, positive contribution to self. It focuses on the self-enhancement and enrichment in old age. Taking part in various types of activities, such as registering in social and community services centers to amuse themselves and socialize. Provisions of entertainment likely leads to their satisfaction to the events, even to their lives. Older adults with more social interaction would have higher self-esteem and higher quality of life in general. Stress management is a contribution to self, revealed in the older person's ability in keeping calm and being mindful in the face Stress management is a contribution to self, revealed in the older person's ability in keeping calm and being mindful in face of stress. It involves intellectual or cognitive processes to counter the stress and negative feelings. Learning, referring to the contribution to the self involving the older adult's willingness to learn certain new things or develop further from present knowledge. It acts as a key to empower, leading to personal assertiveness, decision-making, and collective significance. The cross-generation exchange illustrates the configurative culture. Youth can learn the life wisdom from their elders, and the teen also provides the new and latest information to their elder, especially the IT skills in this era. Experiencing support is a contribution to the self, stemming from the older person's comments about experiencing filial piety with offspring. It partly originates from an individual's activities and perception, although other people's actual behavior also play a part. It requires the younger to pay attention to the supporting behavior and atmosphere of the older. Disengagement is passing the career to offspring. It may contribute to the quality of life, notably health and life satisfaction by reducing the number of stressful obligations. They have to address the stress resulted from retirement. So their commitment to disengagement would ease the retirement process and reduce its stress. Lastly, the study inspires us in three ways which the elderly continue contributing themselves to society. In an aging society like Hong Kong, most people retire in their 60s, and a large percentage of them would find another job after their retirement. It is common to see that Hong Kong older adults continuously working happily as a security or taxi driver 
since they are considered as valuable to the society. At the same time, the elderly is being able and willing to take care of the younger generation. As we mentioned above, passing the knowledge and life wisdom. It is generativity. Voluntarism is doing volunteer work to contribute to society. For example, there is a group of elderly organizing home visits to those who are even older during some traditional Chinese festivals. They bring warmth and caring to the whole community. To give you a more in-depth insight into positive aging in Hong Kong, we prepared a short documentary of two local seniors. In this video, they share their daily life after their retirement. 